Okay, let's do it. Second Chronicles chapter 31. We're in the book of Chron- Second Chronicles. And we've already done a good half of this chapter, but I want to I want to start from the beginning uh, just reading it so that we can have some context. And let's pray before we get into it. Second Chronicles 31. <clears throat> Father, we uh, come before you, and uh, again, Lord, we have our Bibles in our laps, and we're ready to hear from you. Um, Lord, we love it that every time that we open up your word, um, you speak, and you speak clearly. You have, uh, you have things that were written down literally thousand year, thousands of years ago, and uh, they still apply to us today. And it, it's, it's pretty wild, Lord, how alive and powerful your word is. And so as we're going through it, we just pray that you teach us the things that you have for us uh, in those areas where uh, we're walking strong with you. Um, Lord, we just pray that you'd encourage us and in those areas where we may be falling down and and, uh, dropping the ball, Lord, we just pray that uh, you would help us to walk with you in the way that you've called us to. We love you, Lord, and we uh, just give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Chapter 31, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 31, this is in the context of a revival, and we haven't been in the, in the passage for a couple of weeks now, um, but just to uh, bring it back to mind, uh, when Hezekiah comes into power, he's one of the last good kings of uh, the nation of Judah. In fact, he's one of the last two good kings. And so it's Hezekiah and his grandson, uh, Josiah, who are the last good kings of Judah before Judah goes into captivity, and Israel, or Judah specifically, stops being a nation uh, for over 70 years. And so um, this is kind of like the last hurrah, the the last chance, one of the last chances for the people of Israel uh, to come into a right relationship with God. And when Hezekiah goes at it, he goes at it um, wholeheartedly, and the guy just cranks. He, He does a really good job. And so he turns the hearts of the people back towards the Lord. There's a, there's a huge uh, sacrifice that takes place. Uh, they celebrate the Passover, um, not one week, but for two weeks because they're so excited about it. And uh, God just turns the, the hearts of the people around. And it's because uh, they had a leader in Hezekiah who loved the Lord. And in spite of the fact that his uh, family did not, and it came from uh, a situation where uh, the uh, he was in a situation where previous kings had not been following God. So that's where we're at. So basically Hezekiah goes through and he cleans out the temple. He, re, he uh, remodels the temple in, in the sense of he brings it back into shape. Um, he goes through and, and he cleans out all the, all the false gods and all the idols out of the city of Jerusalem. And then what ends up happening uh, is he uh, celebrates Passover. He invites everybody in Judah to come to the Passover celebration. That's kind of like the, the Jewish Thanksgiving. And so he invites everybody in Judah to come to the uh, Passover celebration and all the people up in the northern kingdom of Israel to come to the Passover celebration also. And uh, those are the, the leftovers after the Assyrians came in and fought with them. In any case, uh, when we get to chapter 31, um, you basically have a situation where uh, these people have uh, turned towards the Lord, and so there's going to be some consequences that take place because they've turned towards the Lord. That's the way that it always goes. You give your life to Jesus, you give your life to God, and there are things that have to take place. There are, there are changes that have to happen. There is no redemption without repentance. There is, there is no um, um, forgiveness without confession. And when those things happen, a life changes. And not only, you know, obviously, if a single life changes and you have that multiplied by a nation, you literally have a national change that takes place. Something to keep in mind when we're talking about our own nation. You know, a lot of times what we're looking at is uh, for the politicians to do something. And uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, people who are, are in elite places, whether Uh, we're talking about the school system or whether we're talking about the collegiate system or whether we're talking about corporations. We we look at all these people that we think can make an effect on our planet and for our culture, and that is not the way that God does it. It, um, it, it's It's not usually a situation where it comes that way. What God usually does is he begins changing hearts one at a time. 
And so Tom, sometimes he starts from the bottom, changing hearts one at a, tom, uh, at a time. Sometimes he starts from the top, changing hearts one at a time. But what he does is he changes hearts. And so my heart gets changed, my life gets changed. Your heart gets changed, your life get cha gets changed. I start passing that around, and that's what's going to happen with everybody who's around me. That's what, that's what a revival is. That's what takes place in the land of Judah. And so there are, again, um, situations that come up behind, because of that. Let's start reading in verse 1. It says, Now when all this was finished, and this is the celebration of the Passovers, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke the sacred pillars in pieces, cut down the wooden images, threw down the high places and the altars from all Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh are in the northern kingdom. Uh, Benjamin and Judah are in the southern kingdom. And so this is something that wasn't just confined to the nation of Judah. It went into the northern kingdom of Israel. Until they had utterly destroyed them all, then all the children of Israel returned to their own cities, every man to his own possession. And so again, when God, when God does a work in your life, it, it, there, there are practical changes that take place. Stuff that's in your house that is not of God gets taken out of your house. Stuff that's in your life that's not of God gets taken out of your life. And, you know, so that can be music, that can be media, that can be uh, where you visit um, on, on, the, on the web. Um, it, can be, it can be all kinds of stuff. And so most, you know, most times when, uh, for most of the, the time that I've been a pastor and I've led up a lot of people to the Lord. And when I, when I see what God does in their life, uh, the, the changes that take place are practical, and you can see them. And so people who have been addicted to smoking, they, they go trash their ashtrays and dump the cigarettes, and they're not interested in being you know, enslaved to a little, tu a little paper tube with a bunch of dry brush in it. You know? And so they don't want to do it anymore. And so God frees them from that. The same thing with drinking, the same thing with drugs. It's been the same, you know, the same situation my whole life as a Christian. Jesus changes lives, and you can see it. Um, the, the things that they say, the attitudes that they have, those things turn around. And because of that, there are things that aren't allowed in their home anymore. There are things that they don't do anymore. And they start acting like um, what the Bible says a believer is supposed to look like. And that's what's happening with with these people here. That's, what, that's, the, that's a situation when you come into a real live relationship with Christ. You can see it. S-E-E. -E. You can see it. You can see the changes. And that's what we should obviously all be going for. Here's another uh, change that took place, and we, we did this pretty thoroughly, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But in verse 2, it says, And Hezekiah appointed the divisions of the priests and the Levites, According to their divisions, each man according to his service, the priests and Levites for burnt offerings and peace offerings to serve, to give thanks, and to praise in the gates of the camp of the Lord. The king also appointed a portion of his possessions for the burnt offerings, for the morning and evening burnt offerings, the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths and the new moons, and the set feasts, as it, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Moreover, he commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests and the Levites, that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the children of Israel and Judah, who dwelt in the cities of Judah, brought the tithe of oxen and sheep, also the tithe of holy things, which were consecrated to the Lord their God, they laid in heaps. In the third month, they began laying them in heaps, and they finished in the seventh month. So for four months, this is going on. And when, actually, that's five months. And when Hezekiah and the leaders came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. This is heaps of stuff, food and that kind of stuff. And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have plenty left, for the Lord has blessed his people, and what is left is this great abundance. And so um, after the idols are taken out, what happens is Hezekiah, Hezekiah goes uh, to the situation that's taken place in the city of Jerusalem, his hometown, the city of Jerusalem, he looks at the temple, and he looks at the ministry that's supposed to be there. Now, he's already remodeled the temple, and so now what he wants to do is he wants to bring it up to speed as far as how ministry is supposed to be done there. 
And so what was always supposed to be taking place in the temple is that the priests were supposed to be offering sacrifices for the people. There were, there were feast days where they did these major sacrifices, but every single day they offered sacrifices up for, up for the people of Israel and for the sins of Israel and that kind of thing. And um, it was happening all the time. Well, up until this point, it hadn't been. And so what Hezekiah does is he brings it right back into a biblical norm. So for a long period of time, these people were, were Jews in name only. And at this point, there's been a revival. They've turned to the Lord, and they're not Jews in name only now. Hezekiah wants to make it a real thing. We serve and worship the Lord our God, and in his temple, there is prayer going up, there are sacrifices going up, there is incense being offered, and all those things pictured the sacrifices of Jesus. But he said, we're going to follow the Lord for real, and that's what he does. And again, same thing with us. There needs to be a reality in our walk with God. And so you come into a relationship with God. Don't be satisfied with just having a relationship with God where it's a relationship in name only. I'm not, I'm not just a Christian. I'm a Christian who's in love with Jesus and who follows him. Um, when, I was a, when I was a young guy in construction, this is one of my old stories, um, I, you know, I didn't know anything about Christianity. And so I didn't know about all, you know, I knew, I knew that there were denominations, but I didn't, you know, I kind of didn't know how all that stuff worked. And so my grandma took me to the Baptist church when I was a kid, you know, that, that's the five times or so that I went to church. Um, so I went to the Baptist church. So I knew, the, knew about that. I had friends who were Catholics, so I knew something about that. I had other friends, you know, I, actually that's all I really knew. I didn't know a whole lot about anything else. So I become a Christian, and I don't know what I am. I just think I'm a Christian, right? And so I'm on, on the job this one day, and I, I'm working for a Mormon at the time. I knew the Mormons were different, okay? And so I'm witnessing to my Mormon boss. And so I, uh, I'm on the, on the job this one time, and a guy comes up, and he's a Christian. And so he comes up, and, he, and he's talking to me, and he figures out that I'm a believer, and he goes, so, uh, you, you believe in Jesus? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, you know, what, what kind of believer are you? And I go, well, I'm a Christian. And he goes, what kind of Christian? And I go, uh, I just sat there with, you know, kind of with my mouth hanging open. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. And my boss, the Mormon guy, goes, he's a born-again, Bible-believing, spirit-filled Christian. He knew exactly what I was, even if I didn't know what I was. And he was able to, to describe the whole thing. And it was because there was a change. People could see it. You see what I mean? There, 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 there's stuff going on. And even, even if you don't know everything that's going on, people around you are going to be able to see it, and they can identify what's going on. And so, again, there, there needs to be a reality to this stuff, and so ministry needs to be done. What's, what's supposed to be happening in your life is it comes into a biblical norm. It's not, it's not like it was in the world. It was, it's not like it was before. It's not like a, it was when maybe you were a Christian in name only. It's a situation where there's a biblical norm in your home. We live by the Bible. We live by what the Word of God has to say. And when the Bible says that something is supposed to be done or something is not to, supposed to be done, then that's the way that it goes. That's what a biblical norm is. And so that's what was happening in this situation. Then... When he, when he sets up the, the ministry there, he tells the people, okay, we need to be tithing here. And that was a commandment in, you know, in the Old Testament law for the support of the priests. And that's a law that you had in the Old Testament. It's something that carries into the New Testament too. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it talks about those who are involved in ministry are supposed to be, be being paid by the ministry. And so a lot of that stuff goes from Old Testament to New Testament. And in this case, a tithe is a tenth. And I'm not going to get into that whole thing again because I, I covered it pretty thoroughly. But one of the things that, that happens at the very beginning is they begin giving. And when Hezekiah says, hey, we need to be giving here. We need to be giving to the work of the Lord. The people come in and they start doing it and they do it willingly and they do it in such ridiculous fashion that there's so much left over that there's just heaps of stuff laying around. And so these guys are, they, um, basically uh, in Israel, what you did was you tithed once a year. And so you waited to, you know, throughout the whole year. And at the end of the year, when you went to the feast days, you brought the tithe from your home for that whole year. And the tithe was a tenth of your animal's 
a tenth of your, of your crops. You had the first fruits. When it talks about um, the first fruits of, of grain and wine, it's the idea that, um, uh, the, well, there's a couple of different things that were going on there. There was what was called the feast of first fruits. But there, it was the idea that when you gave to the Lord, you gave first to him. He wasn't, he wasn't you know, the, the thing that you did last on your list of bills. He was the thing that you did first, and that was called the first fruits. You give the first fruits to the Lord. And when that happens, what, what ends up happening is um, the, the ministry there gets blessed in ways that they hadn't seen in probably hundreds of years by this point, in hundreds of years. And again, it's because people's hearts change. When you have a changed heart, it changes your life. And when you have a changed heart, and especially if you're talking about being a, being a believer, um, when you have a changed heart, ministry becomes a huge thing to you. You want a biblical norm. And when you have a changed heart, you become somebody who doesn't care so much about yourself, but begins caring about other things, and especially about the things of God. And so that's what these people do. And um, this, you know, the, the change that takes place in our lives is a personal change uh, in, the, in the sense that it's something that, that's taking place inside our hearts. And you know what? It doesn't get more pers personal than your wallet. It doesn't get more personal than your checkbook doesn't get more personal than your pocketbook. And that's one of the things that God goes after. Um, I, can, I can tell what I love by looking at my checkbook. I can tell, but I can tell what I love, what I, what I care about the most. I can tell what I care about the most by what I'm spending my goods on. And it's something to keep in mind. Uh, because we weren't put here on this planet to get bigger and better toys. We were put here on this planet to make an effect for the kingdom of God and again, that's one of those things that, that you see in the life of these people specifically. And so it's one of those things that, that God's going to deal with you on if he hasn't dealt with you on it um, up until this point. He always goes after the finances, you guys. And you know what? I don't care. It's a, you know, this is not something where I'm going to pass the, around the offering bag after this whole thing. But if you're a Christian, you need to be giving. And if you don't give, there's a problem. It doesn't work any other way. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And if all I'm about is me, 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 I, 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 gimme, 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 there is a problem. And so we need to be paying attention to that whole thing. And I'm speaking from the point of view of somebody who didn't really appreciate it when I first read about tithing in the Bible. When I first read about it, it was like, I was like, a, when I found out a tithe was a tenth, one tenth of your income, I was like, are you nuts? <laughs> you know? And uh, again, you know, I talked about it last time, so I'm not going to go into it, but it's because I was a poor boy. And so, you know, I wasn't greedy in the sense of wanting other people's stuff, but I did want to keep mine because I worked for it. And so I wanted to keep it. And then I found out that the Bible says I'm supposed to be giving it away. You understand the principle of the tithe. It's the idea that, that God has given me everything I have. He's given it all to me. And so actually what I should be doing is giving it all back because it's all his, right? But he allows me to have this. He allows me to work and he allows me to have the ability to work, it says in the book of Deuteronomy. And so what I do when I'm tithing is I'm giving back a tenth as, as, uh, uh, as a statement that I'm thankful for everything that God's given to me. That's what the tithe was about. And so, um, again, it's something that we need to be paying attention to. Verse 11, it says, Now Hezekiah uh, commanded them. You know, one more, one more thing I want to say about this, because I don't know if all of you were here last time. I hate it when people beg for money. I hate it when I see ministries begging for money. I don't like it. And you're never going to hear me begging for money. If I, if I have needs, I'm not going to be bringing, you know, as, as far as the church goes and that kind of stuff, I'm not bringing them to you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in my room, I'm going to close the door, I'm going to hit my knees, and I'm going to say, Jesus, will you help me? That's the way that it's supposed to go. And that's the way it's supposed to go for ministries too. And I understand why, you know, I understand that, that some people don't get that. Um, but I have never asked uh, people in my fellowship for money uh, for the ministry here, and there's a reason for that, and it's because I don't like it. I didn't like it before I was a Christian. I don't like it after I'm a Christian. And I'll, you know, when, when I'm in a passage that teaches on giving, I'll talk to you about the principles of giving because it's a good thing, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome way to uh, be able to, to uh, check out the Lord and see if he's really there. Um, last time I talked about this, one of the points that I made is um, if you're in a situation where you don't know if God is real, you don't know if God's working in your life, you don't know if, if God really cares about you, start tithing 
you're going to find out. It's, it's the only place in the Bible, this is the only issue in the Bible where God says, you can test me on this one. You can check me out on this. If you will come and bring in the tithes and you will bring in the offerings, you see if I don't open a window in heaven that, you know, and pour out on you, on, a, on you a blessing that you won't be able to contain. And it's one of the places where God makes a, makes a promise of provision for us. It's just the really coolest thing. And that has been the case in my life. In, you know, I, I've been tithing since I was a young believer, a long time. And um, God has always provided for me. I keep getting fatter every year, you know, <laughs> unless I want to lose weight. You know, God has always provided for me. God has always taken care of me. And a lot of times he's done it just miraculously. And um, I have no doubt that God's real. I have no God, doubt that God works in my life. And um, it, it still continues to be that situation to this day because I give to the Lord. And I'm not doing that to brag. I'm doing that to let you know everything that God says about the whole, the whole giving thing to him is absolutely true, and you can trust him on it. And it's a cool thing to do. And, you know, it's one of those things that God deals with in, in believers' lives. So maybe you're going through some financial hardship and, uh, and that kind of thing right now. There's a passage in the book of Haggai that says um, you go out and you, do, and you make wages and it seems like you come home, bring your wages, and you put them in your pockets and your pockets have holes in them. Um, you know, you, you come in and you collect much and, and God comes along and blows it all away. And what Haggai says is, is it's because you put the focus on your home instead of his kingdom. And when you take that focus and flip it around, God promises to provide for you. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later on in the passage. It goes on in verse 11, it says, Now Hezekiah commanded them to prepare rooms in the house of the Lord, and they prepared them. In other words, you got to do something with all this stuff. <laughs> you got heaps of stuff sitting out here, so go make some storerooms. And so they go and make storerooms. Then they faithfully brought in the offerings, the tithes, and the dedicated things, um, <clears throat> Conaniah the Levite had charge of them and Shim, uh, Shimei his brother was the next then it names some other guys Jehiel, Azaziah, Nahath, Asahel, Jeremoth I'm not going to read all these guys anyway they were all overseers under the hand of Conaniah and Shimei his brother at the commandment of Hezekiah the king and Azariah the ruler of the house of God Kor the son of Imna verse 14 the Levite the keeper of the east gate was over the freewill offerings to God to distribute the offerings of the Lord and the most holy things. And under him were Eden, uh, many a men, Jeshua, and these other guys, his faithful assistants in the cities of the priests to distribute allotments to their brethren by divisions to the great as well as the small. And what's been spoken about there is the fact that the Levites weren't just in the city of Jerusalem. They were in outlying cities all throughout Israel. These are teaching priests. These are guys who are supposed to be doing ministry among the populace of the people of Israel. And so what, they're, what these guys are doing is taking the abundance that God's given in the city of Jerusalem and passing it out to uh, the brothers who are in other places. And so that's a cool thing. Verse 16, or uh, uh, in, uh, again, verse 15 at the end, uh, uh, his faithful assistance in the cities of the priests to distribute allotments to their brethren by divisions to the great as well as the small. Um, besides those males from three years old and up who were written in the genealogy, they distributed to everyone who entered the house of the Lord um, his daily portion for the work of his service by his division. And it specifically mentions children in the passage, three years old and up. The reason it starts from three years old and up is because in Jewish culture at the time, they were, they were um, uh, uh, breastfeeding their kids up to the age of three years old. And so uh, from that point on, then they would give them solid food. And so the kids are in on uh, the provision that takes, care, takes place here. You know, one of the, one of the things um, that, uh, one of the, the issues that you have in this passage is the fact that these guys had been serving the Lord and uh, they were in a position where they were offering their lives up to God and it had to do with the, the whole priesthood in the Old Testament, but they're still offering their lives up to God. And what God does is he takes care of them and he takes care of their children too. And it's something to keep in mind. Because when I serve the Lord, what God promises to take care of is not only me, 
He promises to take care of my wife, and he promises to take care of my kids, too. And obviously, every single one of those people has a free will, and they can do what they want. Uh, but what I've seen in my own life is that God does a really good job of taking care of the issues that come up in my family. He does a really good job of it, and he's been faithful in that situation. You know, a lot of times um, people will look at the whole issue of, of serving God, and this is what I mean by this. I'm not talking about necessarily going into full-time ministry, but the way, you know, the, guys, the way I was taught when I first became a Christian is you become a Christian and you're here on the planet for a reason. The reason you're here on the planet is to be able to impact people who are around you, and so you need to be involved in ministry. And so some of the first ministries that I did were, you know, ushering and Sunday school and that kind of thing, and new convert counselor, that kind of stuff. Uh, but then I realized that my work is a ministry. And the guys that I work with day to day are guys that, that Jesus put in front of my face so that I could reach out to them. And then there were other ministries that God put me in. I know how to play the guitar, and so I was a worship leader. And then at, at, uh, at a certain point in my life, God made me a teacher. And so I taught home Bible studies. I never expected to be doing this. I expected that I was just going to be doing ministry around my church, that's what I thought. You know, on, on Sundays, I'm going to be doing stuff around church. And then on, on Tuesdays, I'm going to be doing my, my um, home Bible study. And uh, if guys need help, when, you know, with worship and stuff like that, I'll be, I'll be leading worship. And when I go to work, those guys are my ministry, uh, the guys that I work with. That's my ministry. And so I was always ministry-minded because it was thumped into my head that that's what we're here for. I'm not just here to exist. I'm not just here to have a nice life. I'm not just going to church so I can hear something nice and walk out and feel good about myself. The, the reason that all this stuff is happening is so that I can be um, part of what God's doing on this planet to change the lives of the people who are around me. A lot of people look at that and they go, well, I don't know if I want to do that because that might take time away from my family. If it takes time away from my family, then my kids might, you know, might suffer because of it. And so in, instead of... Uh, going after the kingdom of God. And I'm not saying that, that, that you have to deny your kids to be able to serve Jesus. But a lot of times people, people put it in that, in that kind of level. It's like, well, I can, I can either minister for the Lord or I can minister to my family, but I can't do both. That's nonsense. Complete and utter nonsense. That is not the way that things work. And what I've found is that when I've been ministering for the Lord, that God is good to take care of my family in all kinds of ways. And, you know, again, I've been, I've been doing this for a really long time, and I'm a pastor, and I'm a really busy guy, and um, uh, I, have to, I have to do priorities in my life. So my wife's a priority, my kids are a priority. There are times when, when I just step back from all the things that people want me to do so that I can take care of things at home. I'm not saying that I'm just down here all the time or something, but it's like, it's, it's, it's not either or, it's both and, and Jesus takes care of this stuff that, uh, that I'm afraid that I'm going to drop the ball on. He does it. And that's, again, the, the point of a lot of the stuff that, that you see in Scripture. God is good. And so when I'm serving him, if I have my priorities straight and I, um, and I am uh, focusing on the things that God's, God's called me to, then he's going to take care of my life in all the areas of my life that it needs to be taken care of. So my marriage, my family, you know, now I'm in a, in a, in a situation you heard uh, Bobby talking about my mom. And so when, you know, I'm getting older. And so there, there are people in my family who are way older than me. And so my mom's one of those. And I've always known that what was going to happen is my mom, you know, I, I've been praying about this for years. My mom's coming home. She's coming to, she's coming to my house. And so what I'm going to be doing is ministering to her. And so, you know, I happen to be in a situation where, you know, it's like the stuff that I, I do, I can do, you know, in my office or I can do at my home. And so today, stuff happened at home, and so I was able to stay home with my mom. Didn't you know? Didn't do a whole lot with her, but you know, I was there for her, and you know, and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, it's like there's a there's a balance. I don't just ignore people and that kind of thing, but I can I can do both. I can do this stuff. And if I was in construction, it would just it would be a little bit of a different situation. I would have to get up and go to work, and God would provide in all those areas. But um, I was put on this planet to be a minister of Jesus Christ, and so were you. And so God has stuff for you to do. And so don't, don't take uh, one part of your ministry, which is your family, and try to put it above um, the rest of what God's got going in, as far as the kingdom of God goes. 
and again, I'm not saying that your family isn't important. Um, when, when there have been issues in my family where there was danger of, um, of people not walking with the Lord, I did stuff. I'm not telling you everything I did, but I did stuff, and I got it done. And, you know, Jesus involved in the whole thing, Jesus working in the whole thing, but I didn't, you know, I didn't stand back on those things. I, you know, it's like I take care of my family. And uh, again, I guess what I'm saying is all of that stuff can be done all at the same time. I've never had to give up ministry so that I can do family, and I've never had to give up family so that I could do ministry. There, there are times back and forth where, you know, situations come up um, and things have to be put on hold. That's okay for a day or two. That's not a problem. But um, I'm, I'm not giving up either one of them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow Jesus. I'm here on the planet for a reason. I'm going to fulfill what he's got me here for. And um, he's going he's gonna to take care of me. And he does. And he'll take care of you too. I'm no different than anybody in the room. Right? It goes on and says, um, uh, And to the priests, verse 17, who were written in the genealogy, according to their father's house and to the Levites, from 20 years old and up, according to their work by their divisions. And to all who were written in the genealogy, um, and here we have the little ones and their wives, their little ones and their wives, their sons, daughters, the whole company of them. For in their faithfulness, they sanctified themselves in holiness. And so, again, God's taking care of everybody in this situation. Also for the sons of Aaron, the priests, who were in the fields of the common lands of their cities. In every single city, there were men who were designated by name to distribute portions to all the males among the priests and to all who were listed by genealogies among the Levites. Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and true before the Lord is God. That's what God calls us to. Do what is good. Do what's right. Do what's true. And when you fail, you know what's good and right and true? You confess. And then you get up and you do what's good and right and true. And then you fail again and you confess. Ask God to forgive you. And that's good and right and true. And that's, that's the way that life is supposed to go. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandment, to seek his God, he did it with all his heart, so he prospered. And I can tell you that I've prospered as a believer, and that is why. Because you seek God, and what he's going to do is he's going to bless it. Turn over to um, Matthew chapter 6, if you would. Matthew chapter 6. Jesus talked about the same principle. <clears throat> every, every time I get to this passage, I, I want to go through the whole, all of chapter 5 and all of chapter 6 before I get to this passage. But... Um, in verse 19, um, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Remember I was talking about you can tell what you love by looking at your checkbook? That's what, that's what Jesus is talking about there. He says, um, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad or evil or unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. Excuse me. Oh, no, there's paper on that. <laughs> that's sneaky. If therefore the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? An evil eye... Um, in the Bible, is defined in the Bible, in the book of, in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, the, the only place where it's really defined is in the context of being greedy towards people. And so it's like, it's like your brother has something that, that, you know, he's in need, and, and uh, the Bible says in Deuteronomy, beware lest your eye be evil towards your brother, in the sense of you don't want to give, you don't want to help him out, and, and have that kind of thing, you know, have that kind of attitude. In any case, um, he goes on and says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So let me point out to you, in verse 19, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. 
That's a commandment. He says, don't do it. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth. So, is that, con is that contradictory uh, to what people in the world have to say? Is that contradictory to a lot of our attitudes? And he's not talking, you know, when, he, when he's saying this stuff, he's not talking about the, the, the idea of uh, necessarily having a bank account or having a savings account or even having a retirement account. It's the idea of where is your heart? What, what is this about to you? And it's one of those things that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds. You know, when I, when I think of my savings accounts and my bank accounts and that kind of stuff, it's like that stuff can disappear in a day. You know, it can just be all gone. When you think of a retirement accounts, retirement accounts are tied up with the with the um, stock market. All that stuff can be gone in a day. You know, all, all my money can be gone. In, I have a wife. It can all be gone in a Get that? Did you get? No one's laughing. It was just like crickets, man. <laughs> I'm just messing around. But all this stuff can be gone in a day, and we don't put our trust in those things. And so, um, you know, there are, there are other passages where it doesn't uh, condemn rich people. It condemns the love of money. And so I'm not supposed to love money. And that's the point that he's making. So verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon is riches. You cannot serve God in riches. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And so what's the answer to that? Is life more than food and the body more than clothing? Yes, it is. And lots of people are, that's, that's their whole concern. They're concerned with what they're going to put on and they're, they're concerned with what they're going to put in. They're concerned with those two things. And so um, so, sometimes it's not clothing. Well, lots of people in our culture, it's all, it's all about the clothing. You know, I, uh, you know, I've heard of guys who shot other guys over tennis shoes, of all things. Come on. Are you serious? And, you know, um, what you wear becomes, a, becomes, an, becomes an important thing. And you can take this whole concept into all kinds of different areas. You know that people wear their houses, right? So they go out and buy a certain type of house in a certain type of neighbor, neighborhood, and it's doing exactly the same thing as wearing a certain type of suit. They're wearing it. It's not just a place to, you know, to crash at night. It's a, it's a really nice place to crash at night. And it's a, it's a symbol of status. We do this with people, too. And so, you know, you, you, you see the old guys who have the 20-year-old girl hanging off their arm in their arm candy. And, and that kind of thing. And that's, you know, he doesn't love her. He wears her. That's what's happening. And it's, uh, again, it's that kind of thing. And, you know, you see ladies doing the same kind of stuff. And Jesus said, life is more than that. And it's not supposed to be caught up in those things. Um, verse 26, he says, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Just the other day, the, all, the, all the sparrows came out in, front, in my front yard. And they're all, you know, sitting in my front, front yard sheeping. And it's, every, time I, every time that happens, and, you know, it's not springtime, but, you know, they think it is. But every time that happens, I walk out, and this is the kind of stuff that I think of. I look around, and I go, there's all these little sparrows running around, and God cares about each one of them, and he takes care of them. And they're not, you know, they don't, they don't have a barn someplace where they're storing stuff up. God's just going to take care of them, right? So why do you, or excuse, excuse me, verse uh, uh, 26 again, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So, so does God care more about you than little birds? Yes, absolutely, he does. So if he takes care of them, he's going to take care of you. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Um, talking about adding inches to your, to your height. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how, but, uh, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, 
Will he not much more clothe you, O you, you of little faith? And what's the answer to that? Yes, he will. So the flowers are, are about to come out you know, in the next couple of months here. And when you go out and you look around the flowers, you look at the grass growing, you look at all that stuff going on, God is, God is clothing the grass and he's taking care of it. And if he clothes the grass, it's going to, by the time we get to June or July, be nothing but brown. If he clothes the grass, is he not going to take care of you? Is he not going to take care of your needs? You're more important than grass is, obviously. Um, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. That's an important verse, too. So all the unbelievers are seeking all the stuff. That's what they're going after. And so there, there are things that their minds are set on that they think needs to, need to happen in their lives for them to be fulfilled and for them to be happy. And those are the things that they're going after. That's what the Gentiles seek after. In this case, in this case food and clothing and, and shelter and all of that kind of stuff. He says, for all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So I don't have a need that God doesn't know about. He knows what I need. And then he goes on and says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. See that? That's a promise. If I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, what's that mean? So seeking first the kingdom of God is making God king. And it's making him God king in different places. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we, say, we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's just said that in the, in the previous section in this chapter, right? And so seeking first the kingdom of God is the idea that I want God to be king. And where does he need to be king first? Right here. I want him to be king in my life. That's the kingdom of God. And I want him to be king in my home, and I want him to be king in my neighborhood, and I want him to be king in my town, I want him to be king in my church, I want him to be king, I want him to be king at my work, I want him to be king. And that's that whole ministry thing that I was talking about before. Every place that God stuck me was a place that was to be used for ministry to advance the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus has done awesome things for me and I don't have any right to keep it to myself. I need to be passing that on to the people who are around me, right? So that's what it means, seeking first the kingdom of God. And then it says, in his righteousness. So I want the kingdom of God. I want people to come to know Christ. Um, and I want my life to reflect the kingdom of God. And, it's, and it says here, Jesus says, and his righteousness. I want to seek his kingdom. And I want to seek, seek his righteousness. His righteousness is a twofold righteousness. And the first fold is the idea that Jesus' righteousness is given to me so that I can go to heaven. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a cool guy or because I'm awesome. I'm going to heaven because Jesus traded places with me and he's a cool guy and he's awesome. That's called the righteousness of Christ. And so I want to seek first his righteousness. But then his righteousness isn't confined to that because the second fold of the twofold issue there is I want the righteousness of Christ in the sense that I'm not depending on myself for salvation or for any work of God that happens in my life. I want, uh, I want the righteousness of Christ to be something where I'm recognizing that everything I have is nothing but gravy. God's just pouring these things out on me because he's good. Unmerited favor. I'm saved by the grace of God. But secondly, I want to have the practical righteousness that we were talking about earlier. Because when you really give your life to Jesus, there are changes that take place. And you fall in love with the Lord, and because you love him, you want to do the things that please him, and there's a practical righteousness that everybody can see. And those two things go hand in hand. If I, if I have the real righteousness of Christ in my life, if the grace of God has been poured out on me, then I can expect that my life is going to be changed and that people are going to be able to see it. That's his righteousness. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So I'm not supposed to be going after the money. I'm not supposed to be going after the bucks. I'm not supposed to be going after the houses. I'm not supposed to be going after that stuff. And if God has that for you, praise the Lord. He's good. He blessed Abraham. He blessed Job. Then he took it away. Then he blessed him again, right? But he, he, God blesses people, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't put my eyes on the blessing. I put my eyes on the Lord. And whatever he's got for me, 
know, feed me with food that's, that's convenient for me, said in the old King James, King Jimmy. And that's what we want. He goes on and says, verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We spend lots of time worrying about all kinds of issues that are not in our purview. The issues that are in our purview is I'm supposed to be living for the Lord. And all the other issues are God's purview. You know, Jesus on purpose called God our Father. And so, uh, you know, well, most of us grew up in homes where we weren't worrying about the electric bill. Right? Because your parents took care of it. And you weren't necessarily, and I understand, you know, some of us came from <laughs> messed up homes, but, and most of us were not worrying about where we were going to get food the next day. Right? Because our parents were taking care of that. Mom and dad take care of that. And we weren't worrying about, you know, um, our house. We weren't worrying about all that stuff. And it's because, you know, when your family's right and when your parents are, are doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, that's their purview. And God's purview is taking care of my needs. And it's not mine. And again, I'm, you know, it's like I'm, I'm not irresponsible about that. I, you know, the Bible says I'm supposed to work, so I need to work. So if I don't have a job, I go find a job. If I can't find a job, I make getting a job my job until I find one. I pray about it while I'm doing it, and God takes care of it. And he's always done that with me. When I get my job, it's a ministry. And so I'm going to treat my boss like he's the Lord. I'm going to treat the people who are on my job as if, uh, you know, as Jesus would treat them. I'm going to try to bring people to Christ, and, and I'm going to do my work. And I'm, not going to, I'm going to take breaks when I'm supposed to take them, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just not going to be tooling the system, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm going to be, uh, you know, I'm going to be a good worker. I'm going to be a good citizen. I'm going to be doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. And that kind of stuff goes on, and that's the way that it's supposed to go. But my focus is not on all those things, not on, you know, advancing at work and all that kind of stuff. My focus is on Jesus. And as my focus has been on Jesus, I've advanced at work. When my focus is on Jesus, God's blessed me in all kinds of decisions because I'm not just making the decisions. I'm praying about them. Well, God is, you know, this isn't my deal. This is your deal, not my purview. Not what I'm supposed to be doing. I got some choices here. What do you want to do? And God lets me know what he wants to do, and then we go that way, and oh, you know, wow, it got blessed. What ha you know, what's going on there? You know, it's just the hand of God in a person's life. And all that stuff goes together. It's just a really cool thing. Don't you think? So, be encouraged by that. Don't, don't get that all mixed up. And um, make sure that you got your head straight on that stuff because God does want to bless you. And he wants to bless you. you know, he'll bless you financially, but, you know, I don't know. I'm not a millionaire. Do I need to be a millionaire? Do I? No, I don't need to. You know, it's like God, God takes care of me and I try to take care of the stuff that God gives me. When God gives me a new car, I keep it for 10, 12, 14 years until he gives me another one. You know, and then, and, and then we, I don't know, you know, this stuff isn't hard. So, you know, we need to keep the focus. I don't need a new car every two years. I don't need a new house every, you know, every five years. It's not something I need. If God wants to do that, okay. But if, if there's something that's going on where that's important, all right. But that's not what I need. Okay, back over to chapter 32. Where are we at here? Okay. So, Hezekiah's done it right. He's done what's good and right and true before the Lord is God, right? And it says in chapter 32 and verse 1, we're not going to get very far in this, but after these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. He encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that his purpose was to make war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his leaders and commanders to stop the water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs and the brook that ran through the land, saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And he strengthened himself, built up all the wall that was broken, raised it up to the towers, and built another wall outside, also, he repaired the, repaired the millow uh, in the city of David and made weapons and shields in abundance. 
Then he set military captains over the people, gathered them together to him in the open square of the city gate and gave them encouragement saying, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And so in any situation where you begin following the Lord, and it's the case in in the situations that we're talking about right now, because some of you are taking this to heart, and there's been some situations in your life where you know you've been compromising, and you're going to go out and you're going to go, God, I I just want to follow you. I want to have that life that Steve was talking about. So you're going to go out and do that. Do you think Satan's going to just let that go? You think he's not going to attack you? Think think that God's going to sit there and protect you and make sure that nothing bad happens to you? That you know that you know that I don't know that you know, I don't know, <laughs> that your life is just roses all the time. That's not the way that it goes. God allows situations to come on in your life so that He can show Himself strong on your behalf. And so you start walking with the Lord. You start doing, actually doing the things that the Bible says that you're supposed to do. You get a biblical lifestyle. You start doing that. You can expect that Satan's going to attack it. He's not going to just sit back. And a lot of times when this happens, what people do is they go, well, what good is that? You know, I was, I was messing up before. And so now I decide that I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to start following him. And all of a sudden, all this junk starts happening to me. Does God not care? What's, what's going on with that? And what happens in the situation, I'm just going to give you the, most of you know what's, what's going to take place, but what happens in the situation is these armies come up against Jerusalem to attack it, and they all die. All of them die overnight. 185,000 of these guys die overnight, smitten, I like that word, smitten by an angel of God. And so the opposition that Satan brings up against Hezekiah after Hezekiah has done what is good and right and true, the opposition that Satan brings up, God allows so that he can show himself strong on on Hezekiah's behalf in ways that are just awesome. And so it's the same thing with us. So you begin following the Lord, you can expect that there are going to be attacks. You can expect that things are going to happen that are discouraging to you, specifically designed to discourage you. And if you get discouraged by those things, God will allow it to, to, get, your, to get your eyes off the situation, to get your eyes off the circumstances, and to get them right back on Him. Because that's where they're supposed to be. And this is one of Hezekiah's high points. You know, it's, we've, been, we've been talking about Hezekiah being faithful and cleaning things up and straightening things out and stuff like this. This is one of his high points because he does some cool stuff in this passage, and I'm not going to get to it. But anyway, when these things happen, when he gets attacked, the first thing that he does is he does what kings do. He does his job. And what his job is is to make sure that his people are taken care of. Uh, and again, you have a job. There are places that God's put you. There are things that you're supposed to be doing right in the place that you're at. And most of us know what those things are. You have a job. Do your job. And so what Hezekiah does is he first deals with water sources in verse 3 and 4. He consulted with his leaders commands, uh, uh, and commanders to stop the water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. This is what he did to do this. There's a spring at the bottom of what's called the city of David. Basically, you know, I should have put pictures up on the wall. It would have been better for you. But basically, uh, Jerusalem sits on a ridge. And it goes down, uh, it goes down from, um, let me think. It goes down from north to south. This ridge goes down from north to south. And about halfway down the ridge, down at the bottom of the valley, there's a spring that's called the Gion Spring, uh, G-I-H-O-N. And it was the water source for the city of Jerusalem. And so the spring just came up and, you know, came out and it would flow out and into the uh, valley and go down, uh, you know, go down the valley from there. But what they did was they stopped up the spring. And they didn't stop it up. What they did was they put a wall up and they covered it so that nobody from the outside would know that it was there. And then what Hezekiah did was he took a, a group of workers at, um, at an area down at the bottom of the city of David. Remember, it's going down like a... You know, a ridge going down through uh, the area of Jerusalem, going down to the south. And at the bottom, they built a pool. 
and that was called the Pool of Siloam, okay? And what they did was, from that pool where they were going to bring out in the water source, they cut a tunnel. They started cutting it in. Meanwhile, another group of workers up at the Gian Spring, and this has got to be, gosh, it's got to, it's got to be over 150 yards. It might be 300 yards. It's a long ways. Anyway, they, they had one group of guys tunneling from one end and another group of guys tunneling from the other end. They tunneled underneath this ridge, and they did all kinds of back and forth things following the, uh, following the, uh, the easiest ways to tunnel, and they came in and they met in the middle. It's just amazing. And they made this tunnel, and so now the water doesn't go down the valley. The water goes in through this tunnel, goes inside the city, and the, again at the bottom of the ridge, which had walls around the outside, they put a pool, and that's where the water flowed to. And so that was the water that was used, actually, um, from this point on, that was the water that was used for uh, uh, the thirst of the city, to take, you know, taking care of the needs of the city. And so that's what it's talking about when he says he stops up the springs and does all that stuff. He's, he, this guy's on it, man. And so then he went out, they went out and all the other springs that were, that were around uh, the area of Jerusalem, they stopped those up and hid them so that the Assyrian army wouldn't have any water when they came in. Okay, so they do that. That's the first thing that happens, deal with water sources. And then he deals in verse 5 with the walls and the weapons. He strengthened himself, built up all the wall that was broken, raised it up to the towers, built another wall outside. Also, he repaired the millo in the city of David and made weapons and shields in abundance. And so again, he's a king. And so what he's doing is what kings do. And so he builds walls because he's about to get attacked, and he builds weapons with which to defend his people. And um, uh, again, he deals with that. And, and so actually one of these walls they've found. When you go through the Jewish quarter in Jerusalem, there's an area that's open to the air where they've dug down a good 25 feet, and you can see one of the walls of Hezekiah. They know that... It, this wall right there, you can, you can go there and you can see it. This wall that he built. And so he does that. And then um, in verse 6, um, down through verse 8, he builds up morale. Um, in verse 6 he goes, Then he set military captains over the people, gathered them together, gave them encouragement, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that's with him, for there are more with us than with him. Does that sound familiar? You know where he got that from? A guy named Elisha. So Elisha was a prophet, and um, he was around. He was actually a prophet of the northern kingdom, and uh, he came right right after the prophet Elijah. And Elisha uh, was one of the counselors to the king of Israel. He would tell him what was going on, and it got. Uh, the news got brought to the king of Syria that Elisha was letting uh, the king of Israel know all the battle plans of Syria. And this is the way that it happened. The king of Syria, every time he goes to fight against the, the king of Israel, he loses the battle. And he's like, these guys know our plans. And, he, and he, he is in there with his men, and he goes, one of you is a traitor. Somebody's telling the king of Israel what's going on. And one of the guys, one of his generals that was in there, um, makes the point that, you know, he's got a guy named Elisha, and that guy might, might as well be in your bedroom, man. He knows exactly what's going on. And so from that point on, they decided to go after Elisha. Pretty smart battle strategy. You need to get rid of that guy so we can take out the king of Israel. And so he decides to go against Elisha, and Elisha this one time is in a small city, and the king of Syria comes with his troops and surrounds the cities with chariots and, and, and um, soldiers, and his servant um, Gehazi, we know that from another passage, gets up and he goes out and he goes, Master, we're surrounded, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, we're surrounded, what are we going to do? And what, the, and what Elisha says to him is that there are more who are for us than for him. And then he says, open his eyes, Lord. And God opens his eyes and there's chariots of fire, angels and chariots of fire all around the city protecting Elisha. And that's where Hezekiah is getting that phrase from, most likely. He knows what Elisha said. He understood what, what happened with Elisha and Gehazi and the king of Syria. And he understands that the king of Assyria, there are two different kingdoms, the king of Assyria has no more power than the king of Syria did against the prophet Elisha. 
And so he encourages his people with those words. And he says, there are more with us than with him. And what he's talking about is the angels of God. The angel of God encamps round about those who fears him and protects him. And that's something that we've got a, we've got a promise of in our lives. And so he encourages the people with this whole thing. With him, verse 8, talking about what the king of Assyria is an arm of flesh. It's this right here, arm of flesh, big muscles. Look at all these guys, and they're all studly, and they're all ripped, and you know they're all ready for battle and, and that kind of stuff. And king, Hezekiah acknowledges that. These guys have an arm of flesh. Yeah, they're powerful. Yeah, they, they've got some strength there. Um, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And so if it's a choice between somebody with big biceps and ripped, and ripped abs or God himself, which one would you pick to be on your side? And you can ask Goliath about that, see what he says. In any case, uh, it says, and the people were strengthened by the words of uh, Hezekiah, king of Judah. Okay, so you get attacked. You decide to do what Jesus wants you to do, and you get attacked in the midst of that whole thing. And when you get attacked, what you're supposed to do is do the things that you're supposed to do. So I am a child of God, and there are things that God has called me to do as a child of God. So one of those is talk to him. So I'm supposed to be in prayer, right? So I'm supposed to be praying. How's your prayer life going? Do you talk to the Lord? Do you spend time with him? If you're not spending time with him, it's an issue. Do your job. You've got to spend time with the Lord. So I need to be praying. I need to be hearing from the Lord. And one of the best ways to hear from the Lord is through the Word of God. And not just on Sundays and not just on Wednesdays when you come to Calvary Chapel and listen to Steve speak in his hacked up voice, right? That is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is you and the Lord alone sitting down with your Bible, open it up, ask God to speak to you from it, and then sit there and read and spend time with the Lord. I need to be praying. I need to be reading my Bible. I need to be in fellowship. And that's what you're doing right now. You're going to church. Um, but fellowship is a little bit more than that. It's not just walking in the door and walking out. It's coming into church and, and ministering to other people who are around you and being ministered to by them. And so you need to be in fellowship. And then the, the fourth thing that you're called to do, every single one of us is called to be a witness. You're going to be a good witness or you're going to be a bad one. And witness um, in the Bible is the same thing as being a witness in our culture. When you are a witness, you go on the witness stand and they tell you that they want to know what you know about the situation and you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. That's what being a witness is. And it's the same kind of idea. I am supposed to be somebody who will tell, tell people around me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Not just the truth I'm comfortable with, not just the truth they're comfortable with. I'm supposed to be telling people the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's what a witness is. And so when you do those things, when you're reading your Bible, when you're praying, when you're in fellowship, when you're, wit uh, when you're witnessing, the first three are taken in. I'm spending time with the Lord. That's, God's going to be blessing me. He's going to be filling me up. I'm spending time in the Word. God's going to be blessing me. He's going to be filling me up. I'm spending time in fellowship. You come here and you listen to Bible studies and other people are praying for you and cool things are going on there. God's blessing you and he's filling you up. You're taken in, taken in, taken in, and then you need to be given out. And that's the witnessing part. And if you're doing that, then what, what's going to happen is good things are going to be taking place in your life. It's, it's where, what God designed us to be. It's where he designed us to be. And as long as I've been a Christian, something that I was taught the, the first day I got saved. And as long as I've been a Christian, that's been a principle that I've looked at ever since that point. It's in Acts chapter 2, verse, verses 42 through 46. It's how the early church grew. It's how you'll grow too. And so what you do is you do what you're supposed to be doing. And that's what Hezekiah does. And so he makes sure that he has a good supply of water. What's our supply of water? The Holy Spirit. Right? Good supply of water. He makes sure that the walls are built and the weapons are there. What are the weapons of our warfare? Are there spears and knives and guns and hand grenades? Weapons of our, our warfare are, are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. And so the Word of God, yeah, he's holding up his Bible. Word of God. Actually, it's the Word of God 
uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know what the Word is in that passage? It's the spoken Word of God. So the sword of the Spirit is not your Bible. The sword of the Spirit is your Bible taken, read, put here, and then spoken out like this. That's the sword of the Spirit. So when I take the Word of God, make it a part of me, and then I share that with the people who are around me, that's the sword of the Spirit. That's how you get to people's hearts. And so you have the weapons, you have the walls, praying for protection, and that kind of thing. And then finally you have encouragement. And he says, be strong and courageous. And so you, you have this with Hezekiah with his people. You had the same thing with Joshua and his people. Um, actually, God to Joshua, only be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that's encouraging. You know, I'm, not, I'm not bold because um, you know, I decide to be. I'm not bold because um, I'm, I'm you know, more um, aggressive than anybody around me. I'm bold because I have Jesus with me. You know, me and, me and God is a majority in any situation. And that's the way that it's supposed to be with us. We're not bold because we have the personality. We're not bold because we're aggressive. We're bold because God is with us. He's the one who's going to take care of us. So, good? Isn't that awesome? Yeah, let's pray. Thanks again, Lord, for your work in our lives. Thanks again, Lord, for the fact that you brought us to this place, this, this place where we're sitting right now, and we get to spend time in your presence and spend time in your word and hear truths that, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're just stuff that's been around a long time, and these things haven't changed. It's all still the same. Um, it's the fundamentals. It's the, it's the things that you've called us to as believers. God, we pray that you'd help us to be able to do our job, to, to do the things that you've called us to in the way that you've called us to do it, and, uh, Lord, that we be faithful to do those things, whether we're seeing results or not. And understand, Lord, that you have the results in your hand. It's not something that's in our hand. Um, Lord, we thank you for the way that you've blessed us. Uh, and a lot of us have, um, have been Christians for a long time. And we know your blessing in our lives. Some of us have been Christians for a short time. And they're going to know your blessing in their lives if they hang in there with you. And so, God, uh, we just pray that you would help us all to do that. Help us to stick to it. And we ask that you do this in Jesus' name. Bless these people. Go before them and just honor them as they honor you. Amen.